Recorded Books Incorporated presents an unabridged recording of Another Fine Myth by Robert Asprin. Narrated by Jeff Woodman. This work, copyrighted 1978 by Robert L. Asprin, is recorded by arrangement with Curtis Brown Limited. This recording is copyrighted 1997 by Recorded Books Incorporated. And now, another fine myth. Chapter 1 There are things on heaven and earth, Horatio, man was not meant to know. Hamlet One of the few redeeming facets of instructors, I thought, is that occasionally they can be fooled. It was true when my mother taught me to read, it was true when my father tried to teach me to be a farmer, and it's true now when I'm learning magic. You haven't been practicing, Garkin's harsh admonishment interrupted my musings. I have, too, I protested. It's just a difficult exercise. As if in response, the feather I was levitating began to tremble and wobble in midair. You aren't concentrating, he accused. It's the wind, I argued. I wanted to add, from your loud mouth, but didn't dare. Early in our lessons, Garkin had demonstrated his lack of appreciation for cheeky apprentices. The wind, he sneered, mimicking my voice. Like this, dolt. My mental contact with the object of my concentration was interrupted as the feather darted suddenly toward the ceiling. It jarred to a halt as if it had become embedded in something, though it was still a foot from the wooden beams then slowly rotated to a horizontal plane. Just as slowly, it rotated on its axis, then swapped ends and began to glide around in an invisible circle like a leaf caught in an eddy. I risked a glance at Garkin. He was draped over his chair, feet dangling, his entire attention apparently devoted to devouring a leg of roast lizard bird, a bird I had snared, I might add. Concentration indeed. He looked up suddenly, and our eyes met. It was too late to look away, so I simply looked back at him. Hungry? His grease-flecked salt-and-pepper beard was suddenly framing a wolfish grin. Then show me how much you've been practicing. It took me a heartbeat to realize what he meant. Then I looked up, desperately. The feather was tumbling floorward, a bare shoulder height from landing. Forcing the sudden tension from my body, I reached out with my mind. Gently, form a pillow, don't knock it away. The feather halted a scant two hand spans from the floor. I heard Garkin's low chuckle, but didn't allow it to break my concentration. I hadn't let the feather touch the floor for three years, and it wasn't going to touch now. Slowly, I raised it until it floated at eye level. Wrapping my mind around it, I rotated it on its axis, then enticed it to swap ends. As I led it through the exercise, its movement was not as smooth or sure as when Garkin set his mind to the task, but it did move unerringly in its assigned course. Although I hadn't been practicing with the feather, I had been practicing. When Garkin was not about or preoccupied with his own studies, I devoted most of my time to levitating pieces of metal, keys to be specific. Each type of levitation had its own inherent problems. Metal was hard to work with because it was an inert material. The feather, having once been part of a living thing, was more responsive. Too responsive. To lift metal took effort. To maneuver a feather required subtlety. Of the two, I preferred to work with metal. I could see a more direct application of that skill in my chosen profession. Good enough, lad. Now put it back in the book. I smiled to myself. This part I had practiced, not because of its potential applications, but because it was fun. The book was lying open on the end of the workbench. 
I brought the feather down in a long, lazy spiral, allowing it to pass lightly across the pages of the book and up in a swooping arc, stopped it, and brought it back. As it approached the book the second time, I disengaged part of my mind to dart ahead to the book. As the feather crossed the pages, the book snapped shut like the jaws of a hungry predator, trapping the missile within its grasp. Hmm, intoned Garkin. A trifle showy, but effective. Just a little something I worked up when I was practicing, I said casually, reaching out with my mind for the other lizard bird leg. Instead of floating gracefully to my waiting hand, however, it remained on the wooden platter as if it had taken root. Not so fast, my little sneak thief. So you've been practicing, eh? He stroked his beard thoughtfully with the half-gnawed bone in his hand. Well, certainly. Didn't it show? It occurred to me that Garkin is not as easy to fool as it sometimes seems. In that case, I'd like to see you light your candle. It should be easy if you've been practicing as much as you claim. I have no objections to trying, but as you have said yourself so many times, some lessons come easier than others. Although I sounded confident, my spirit sank as the large candle came floating to the work table in response to Garkin's summons. In four years of trying, I was yet to be successful at this particular exercise. If Garkin was going to keep me from food until I was successful, I could go hungry for a long time. Say, uh, Garkin... It occurs to me I could probably concentrate better on a full stomach. It occurs to me that you're stalling. Couldn't I... Now, Skeeve. There was no swaying him once he used my proper name. That much I had learned over the years. Lad, thief, idiot, turnip head, though derogatory, as long as he used one of these, his mind was still open. Once he reverted to using my proper name... It was hopeless. It is indeed a sorry state when the sound of your own name becomes a knell of doom. Well, if there was no way around it, I'd just have to give it my best shot. For this there could be no half-effort or feigned concentration. I would have to use every ounce of my strength and skill to summon the power. I studied the candle with a detached mind, momentarily blanking the effort ahead from my consciousness. The room, the cluttered workbench, Garkin, even my own hunger faded from view as I focused on the candle, though I had long since memorized its every feature. It was stout, nearly six inches across to stabilize its ten-inch height. I had carved numerous mystic symbols into its surface, copied painstakingly from Garkin's books at his direction, though many of them were partially obliterated by hardened rivulets of wax. The candle had burned many long hours to light my studies, but it had always been lit from a taper from the cooking fire and not from my efforts. Negative thought, stop it. I will light the candle this time. I will light it because there is no reason I should not. Consciously deepening my breathing, I began to gather the power. My world narrowed further, until all I was aware of was the curled, blackened wick of the candle. I am Skeeve. My father has a farmer's bond with the earth. My mother was an educated woman. My teacher is a master magician. I am Skeeve. I will light this candle. I could feel myself beginning to grow warm as the energies began to build within me. I focused the heat on the wick. Like my father, I tapped the strength of the earth. The knowledge my mother gave me is like a lens, enabling me to focus what I have gained. The wisdom of my teacher directs my efforts to those points of the universe most likely to yield to my will. I am Skeeve. The candle remained unlit. There was sweat on my forehead now, and I was beginning to tremble with the effort. No, that was wrong. I should not tense. 
relax. Don't try to force it. Tenseness hinders the flow. Let the energies pass freely. Serve as a passive conductor. I forced myself to relax, consciously letting the muscles in my face and shoulders go slack as I redoubled my efforts. The flow was noticeably more intense now. I could almost see the energy streaming from me to my target. I stretched out a finger which focused the energies even more. The candle remained unlit. I couldn't do it. Negative thought, stop it. I am Skeev. I will light the candle. My father... No, negative thought. Do not rely on others for your strength. I will light the candle because I am Skeev. I was rewarded by a sudden surge of energy at the thought. I pursued it, growing heady with power. I am Skeev. I am stronger than any of them. I escaped my father's attempts to chain me to a plow as he had my brother. My mother died from her idealism, but I used her teachings to survive. My teacher is a gullible fool who took a thief for an apprentice. I have beaten them all. I am Skeev. I will light the candle. I was floating now. I realized how my abilities dwarfed those around me. Whether the candle lit or not was inconsequential. I am Skeev. I am powerful. Almost contemptuously, I reached out with my mind and touched the wick. A small bright ember appeared, as if in answer to my will. Startled, I sat up and blinked at the candle. As I did, the ember disappeared, leaving a small white plume of smoke to mark its departure. I realized too late I had broken concentration. Excellent, lad! Garkin was suddenly beside me, pounding my shoulder enthusiastically. How long he had been there, I neither knew nor cared. It went out, I said plaintively. Never you mind that. You lit it. You have the confidence now. Next time it will be easy. By the stars, we'll make a magician of you yet. Here, you must be hungry. I barely got my hand up in time to intercept the remaining lizard bird leg before it smacked into my face. It was cold. I don't mind admitting I was beginning to despair, lad. What made that lesson so hard? Has it occurred to you you could use that spell to give you extra light when you're picking a lock, or even to start a fire to serve as a diversion? Well, I thought about it, but extra light could draw unwanted attention. As for starting a diversion, I'd be afraid of hurting someone. I don't want to hurt anyone, just... I stopped, realizing what I was saying, too late. A heavy cuff from Garkin sent me sprawling off my stool. I thought so. You're still planning to be a thief. You want to use my magics to steal. He was towering in his rage, but for once I stood my ground. What of it? I snarled. It beats starving. What's so good about being a magician anyway? I mean, your lifestyle here gives me so much to look forward to. I gestured at the cluttered room that was the entirety of the hut. Listen to the wolfling complain, Garkin sneered. It was good enough for you when the winter drove you out of the woods to steal. It beats sleeping under a bush, you said. And it still does. That's why I'm still here. But I'm not going to spend the rest of my life here. Hiding in a little hut in the woods is not my idea of a future to look forward to. You were living on roots and berries until I came along and started trapping meat for the fire. Maybe that's your idea of a wonderful life, Garkin, but it's not mine. We glared at each other for several long moments. Now that my anger was vented, I was more than a little afraid. While I hadn't had extensive experience in the field, 
I suspected that sneering at magicians was not the best way to ensure a long and healthy future. Surprisingly enough, it was Garkin who gave ground first. He suddenly dropped his gaze and bowed his head, giving me a rare view of the unkempt mass of hair atop it. Perhaps you're right, Skeev. His voice was strangely soft. Perhaps I've been showing you all the work of magic, but not the rewards. I constantly forget how suppressed magic is in these lands. He raised his eyes to meet mine again, and I shivered at the impact. They weren't angry, but deep within them burned a glow I had never seen before. Know you now, Skeev, that all lands are not like this one nor was I always as you see me now. In lands where magic is recognized instead of feared as it is here, it is respected and commissioned by those in power. There a skillful magician who keeps his wits about him can reap a hundred times the wealth you aspire to as a thief, and such power that... He broke off suddenly and shook his head as if to clear it. When he opened his eyes again, the glow I had seen burning earlier had died to an ember. But you aren't to be impressed by words, are you, lad? Come, I'll show you a little demonstration of some of the power you may one day wield, if you practice your lessons, that is. The joviality in his voice was forced. I nodded my agreement in answer to that burning gaze. Truth to tell, I needed no demonstration. His soft, brief oration had awed me far more than any angry tirade or demonstration, but I didn't wish to contradict him at this time. I don't believe he actually noticed my response. He was already striding into the large pentagram permanently inscribed on the floor of the hut. As he walked, he gestured absent-mindedly and the charred copper brazier scuttled forth from its place in the corner to meet him at the center of the pentagram. I had time to reflect that perhaps it was that brazier that had first drawn me to Garkin. I remembered the first time I peered through the window of his hut, seeking to identify and place objects of value for a later theft. I had seen Garkin, as I have seen him so often since, pacing restlessly up and down the room his nose buried in a book. It was a surprising enough sight as it was, for reading is not a common pastime in this area, but what captured my attention was the brazier. It hobbled about the room, following Garkin like an impatient puppy that was a little too polite to jump up on its master to get his attention. Then Garkin had looked up from his book, stared thoughtfully at his workbench, then with a nod of decision gestured. A small pot of unidentified content rose from the clutter and floated to his waiting hand. He caught it, referred to his book again, and poured out a dollop without looking up. Quick as a cat, the brazier scrambled under his hand and caught the dollop before it reached the floor. That had been my introduction to magic. Something wrenched my attention back to the present. What was it? I checked Garkin's progress. No, he was still at work, half hidden by a floating cloud of vials and jars, mumbling as he occasionally plucked one from the air and added a bit of its contents to the brazier. Whatever he was working on, it promised to be spectacular. Then I heard it again, a muffled step outside the hut. But that was impossible. Garkin always set the... I began to search my memory. I could not recall Garkin setting the protective wards before he started to work. Ridiculous. Caution was the first and most important thing Garkin hammered into me, and part of caution was always setting wards before you started working. He couldn't have forgotten. But he had been rather intense and distracted. I was still trying to decide if I should attempt to interrupt Garkin's work when he suddenly stepped back from the brazier. He fixed me with his gaze, and my warning died in my throat. This was not the time to impose reality on the situation. 
The glow was back in his eyes, stronger than before. Even demonstrations should give a lesson, he intoned. Control, Skeev. Control is the mainstay of magic. Power without control is a disaster. That is why you practice with a feather, though you are able to move much larger and heavier objects. Control. Even your meager powers would be dangerous unless controlled, and I will not teach you more until you have learned that control. He carefully stepped out of the pentagram. To demonstrate the value of control, I will now summon forth a demon, a being from another world. He is powerful, cruel, and vicious, and would kill us both if given the chance. Yet despite this, we need not fear him because he will be controlled. He will be unable to harm us or anything else in this world as long as he is contained within that pentagram. Now watch, Skeev. Watch and learn. So saying, he turned once more to the brazier. He spread his hands, and as he did, the five candles at the points of the pentagram sprang to life, and the lines of the pentagram began to glow with an eerie blue light. Silence reigned for several minutes. Then he began to chant in a low mumble. A thread of smoke appeared from the brazier, but instead of rising to the ceiling, it poured onto the floor and began to form a small cloud that seethed and pulsed. Garkin's chanting was louder now, and the cloud grew and darkened. The brazier was almost obscured from view, but there, in the depths of the cloud, Something was taking shape. Istvan sends his greetings, Garkin. I nearly jumped out of my skin at the words. They came from inside the hut, but not inside the pentagram. I whirled toward their source. A figure was standing just inside the door, blinding in a glowing gold cloak. For a mad moment, I thought it was the demon answering Garkin's summons. Then I saw the crossbow. It was a man, all right. But the crossbow, cocked and loaded in his hand, did little for my peace of mind. Garkin did not even turn to look. Not now, you fool, he snarled. It has been a long hunt, Garkin, the man continued as if he hadn't heard. You've hidden yourself well, but did you really hope to escape? You dare? Garkin spun from his work, towering in his rage. The man saw Garkin's face now, saw the eyes, and his face contorted into a grotesque mask of fear. Reflexively, he loosed the bolt from his crossbow, but too late. I did not see what Garkin did, things were happening too fast but the man suddenly disappeared in a sheet of flame. He shrieked in agony and fell to the floor. The flame disappeared as suddenly as it had come, leaving only the smoldering corpse as evidence it had existed at all. I remained rooted to the spot for several moments before I could move or even speak. Garkin, I said at last, I... Garkin! Garkin's form was a crumpled lump on the floor. I was at his side in one bound, but I was far too late. The crossbow bolt protruded with silent finality from his chest. Garkin had given me my last lesson. As I stooped to touch his body, I noticed something that froze my blood in its veins. Half hidden by his form was the extinguished candle from the north point of the pentagram. The lines were no longer glowing blue. The protective spell was gone. With agonizing effort, I raised my head and found myself gazing into a pair of yellow eyes flecked with gold that were not of this world. Chapter 2 Things are not always as they seem. Mandrake
Once, in the woods, I found myself face to face with a snake cat. On another occasion, I encountered a spider bear. Now, faced with a demon, I decided to pattern my behavior after that which had saved me in the aforementioned situations. I froze. At least, in hindsight, I like to think it was a deliberate, calculated act. The demon curled its lips back, revealing a double row of needle-sharp teeth. I considered changing my chosen course of action. I considered fainting. The demon ran a purple tongue over his lips and began to slowly extend a taloned hand toward me. That did it. I went backward, not in a cat-like graceful bound, but scrabbling on all fours. It's surprising how fast you can move that way when properly inspired. I managed to build up a substantial head of steam before I crashed head first into the wall. Gah, I said. It may not seem like much, but at the time it was the calmest expression of pain and terror I could think of. At my outburst, the demon seemed to choke. Several ragged shouts erupted. Then he began to laugh. It wasn't a low, menacing laugh, but the wholehearted, enthusiastic laughter of someone who has just seen something hysterically funny. I found it both disquieting and annoying. Annoying because I had a growing suspicion I was the source of his amusement. Disquieting because, well, he was a demon, and demons are... Cold, vicious, and bloodthirsty, the demon gasped as if he had read my thoughts. You really bought the whole line, didn't you, kid? I beg your pardon, I said, because I couldn't think of anything else to say. Something wrong with your ears? I said, cold, vicious, I heard you. I meant, what did you mean? What I meant was that you were scared stiff by a few well-chosen words from my esteemed colleague, I'll wager. He jerked a thumb at Garkin's body. Sorry for the dramatics. I felt a touch of comic relief was necessary to lighten an otherwise tragic moment. Comic relief? Well, actually, I couldn't pass up the opportunity. You should have seen your face. He chuckled to himself as he strode out of the pentagram and began leisurely inspecting the premises. So this is Garkin's new place, huh? What a dump. Who would have thought he'd come to this? To say I was perplexed would be an understatement. I wasn't sure how a demon should act, but it wasn't like this. I could have bolted for the door, but I didn't seem to be in immediate danger. Either this strange being meant me no harm, or he was confident of his ability to stop me, even if I tried to flee. For the sake of my nervous system, I decided to assume the former. The demon continued to inspect the hut while I inspected him. He was humanoid. That is, he had two arms, two legs, and a head. He was short but powerfully built, a bit broader across the shoulders than a man and heavily muscled, but he wasn't human. I mean, you don't see many hairless humans with dark green scales covering their body and pointed ears lying flat against their head. I decided to risk a question. Uh, excuse me? Yeah, kid. Um, you are a demon, aren't you? Huh? Oh, yeah, I guess you could say I am. Well, if you don't mind my asking, why don't you act like a demon? The demon shot me a disgusted look, then turned his head heavenward in a gesture of martyrdom. Everybody's a critic. Tell you what, kid, would you be happier if I tore your throat out with my teeth? Well, no, but for that matter, who are you anyway? Are you an innocent bystander? Or did you come with the assassin? I'm with him, I hastened to reply, pointing a shaky finger at Garkin's body. That bit about tearing my throat out had me on edge again. Or at least I was. 
Garkin. The one who summoned... Him. I'm... I was his student. No kidding. Garkin's apprentice? He began advancing toward me, reaching out a hand. Please to... Was wrong. As he moved toward me, I had started backing away from him. I tried to do it casually, but he had noticed. Well, it's... You are a demon. Yeah, so? Um, well, demons are supposed to be... Hey, relax, kid. I don't bite. Look, I'm an old buddy of Garkin's. I thought you said you were a demon. That's right. I'm from another dimension. A dimension traveler, or demon for short, get it? What's a dimension? The demon scowled. Are you sure you're Garkin's apprentice? I mean, he hasn't told you anything at all about dimensions? No, I answered. I mean, yes, I'm his apprentice, but he never said anything about the demonsons. That's dimensions, he corrected. Well, a dimension is another world. Actually, one of several worlds existing simultaneously with this one, but on different planes. Follow me? No, I admitted. Well, just accept that I'm from another world. Now, in that world, I'm a magician, just like Garkin. We had an exchange program going where we could summon each other across the barrier to impress our respective apprentices. I thought you said you were a demon, I said suspiciously. I am. Look, kid, in my world, you'd be a demon, but at the current moment, I'm in yours, so I'm a demon. I thought you said you were a magician. I don't believe this. The demon made his angry appeal to the heavens. I'm standing here arguing with some twerp of an apprentice. Look, kid. He fixed me with his gaze again. Let me try it this way. Are you going to shake my hand, or am I going to rip your heart out? Since he put it that way. I mean, for a minute there, when he lost his temper and started shouting, he sounded just like Garkin. It gave credibility to his claim of friendship with my ex-teacher. I took his extended hand and shook it cautiously. I'm... My name is Skeev. His grip was cold but firm. So firm, in fact, that I found it impossible to reclaim my hand as rapidly as I would have liked. Pleased to meet you, kid. I'm Oz. Oz? No relation. No relation to what? I asked, but he was examining the room again. Well, there's certainly nothing here to arouse the greedy side of his fellow beings. Early primitive, enduring, but not particularly sought after. We like it, I said rather stiffly. Now that I was over being scared, I didn't like the sneer in his voice. The hut wasn't much, and I certainly wasn't overly fond of it, but I resented his criticism. Don't get your back up, kid, Oz said easily. I'm looking for a motive, that's all. Motive? A reason for someone to off old Garkin. I'm not big on vengeance, but he was a drinking buddy of mine, and it's got my curiosity up. He broke off his inspection of the room to address me directly. How about you, kid? Can you think of anything? Any milkmaids he's seduced or farmers he's cheated? You've got an interest in this too, you know. You might be the next target. But the guy who did it is dead. I gestured to the charred lump by the door. Doesn't that finish it? Wake up, kid. Didn't you see the gold cloak? That was a professional assassin. Somebody hired him, and that somebody would hire another one. A chill ran down my spine. I hadn't really thought of that. I began to search my memory for a clue. Well, he said Istvan sent him. What's an Istvan? I don't... Wait a minute. What do you mean I might be the next target? Neat, huh? 
Oz was holding up the gold cloak. Lined and completely reversible. Always wondered how come no one noticed them until they were ready to pounce. Oz? Hmm? Oh, didn't mean to scare you. It's just if someone's declared open season on magicians in general, or Garkin specifically, you might have some... Hello, what's this? What's what? I asked, trying to get a look at what he had found. This, he said, holding his prize aloft. It seems I'm not the only demon about. It was a head, apparently the assassin's. It was badly charred, with bone showing in several places. My natural revulsion at the sight was compounded by several obvious features. The chin and ears of the head were unnaturally pointed, and there were two short, blunt horns protruding from the forehead. A devil! I exclaimed in horror. A what? Oh, a devil! No, it's not from Diva. It's from Impair. An imp. Didn't Garkin teach you anything? Come again? I asked, but Oz was busy scowling at the head. The question is, who would be crass enough to hire an imp for an assassin? The only one I can think of is Istvan, but that's impossible. But that's who did it. Don't you remember? I told you. I thought you said Istvan. I did. Wait a minute, what did you say? I said Istvan. Can't you tell the difference? No, I admitted. Hmm, must be too subtle for the human ear to detect. Oh well, no matter. This changes everything. If Istvan is up to his old tricks, there's no time to lose. Hey, wait a minute, what's this? It's a crossbow, I observed. With heat-seeking, armor-piercing quarrels? Is that the norm in this world? Heat-seeking? Never mind, kid, I didn't think so. Well, that tears it. I better check this out quick. He began to stride into the pentagram. I suddenly realized he was preparing to leave. Hey, wait a minute, what's going on? It would take too long to explain, kid. Maybe I'll see you again sometime. But you said I might be a target. Yeah. Well, that's the way it crumbles. Tell you what, start running, and maybe they won't find you until it's over. My head was a whirl. Things were happening far too fast for clear thought. I still didn't know what or who the demon was or if I should trust him, but I did know one thing. He was the closest thing to an ally I had in a situation where I was clearly outclassed. Couldn't you help me? No time. I gotta move. Couldn't I come with you? You'd just get in the way, maybe even get me killed. But without you, I'll be killed. I was getting desperate, but Oz was unimpressed. Probably not. Tell you what, kid, I've really got to get going, but just to show you I think you'll survive, I'll show you a little trick you might use sometime. You see all this crud Garkin used to bring me across the barrier? Well, it's not necessary. Watch close, and I'll show you how we do it when our apprentices aren't watching. I wanted to shout, to make him stop and listen to me, but he had already started. He spread his arms at shoulder height, looked heavenward, took a deep breath, then clapped his hands. Nothing happened.